Okay, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Viggy with the Every Life Foundation I'm here for the uh, RDLA March legislative meeting. Um, thank you all for joining. We have a pretty full schedule today, so um, we're going to try and get through it quickly. Um, on the agenda, um, Cheryl Yeager is going to be speaking first regarding the American Health Care Act, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are are hoping to hear about that. Um, Jennifer Zins with uh, Perry Communications is going to be discussing California's AB 265 and copay assistance. Uh, Stephanie Krenrich with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation will um, discuss a patient provider letter on, on Medicaid in the American Health Care Act. Um, Patricia Egan is, is with us and she'll be giving an update on um, the Lymphedema Treatment Act. Um, my colleague Max Bronstein will give um, a, an overview of the new FDA commissioner, PDUFA reauthorization, and an update on, on the OPEN Act. Um, and then I will uh, give a, a presentation on the newborn screening work that uh, the Every Life Foundation has been doing in Florida. Um, Nancy Goodman with uh, Kids v. Cancer will discuss the uh, Race for Children's Act. And finally, Dean Sir, uh, who is president of the MLD Foundation, will discuss um, rarepolicy.us, a new um, initiative that uh, he has been working on. So first, I'm going to begin by uh, passing um, the, uh, the mic over to um, Cheryl Yeager. So let me just uh, make sure that um, she is on. Hi, Cheryl, are you there? Hey, Cheryl, I apologize. Can you off mute? Yes, I am here and um, happy to give people an update on a moving, moving process. Hello, Cheryl? Seems like yes. we might have talked. Okay, there you are. Hello? Diggy can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just a, it's a tough connection. It's a tough connection. I'm going to try to move to make it better. Um, all right, so the quick update on where things are right now is that it's a moving target. Um, the House is expected to um, basically take the two policies that were approved by the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Ways and Means Committee last week, combine those two packages into one package in the House Budget Committee. That markup is scheduled for tomorrow. If all things were perfect, um, as much as things could perfectly be in the legislative process, they would, um, they would then schedule that legislation to be voted on the floor next week. But as you all have seen, I'm sure, on the front page news, there's a lot of moving parts because of the CBO score. So right now, um, they are analyzing what changes need to be made so that they can get to 218 votes in the House um, with Republicans. And the viewpoints about what policy changes need to potentially be made vary greatly. Um, for those of you all who um, were at the D.C. Legislative Affairs Conference, the two big areas of discussion are the Medicaid reforms and how those work and the tax credits and how tax credits So there's different views in the Republican conference about what needs to be changed on those pieces. And the CBO score that came out Monday evening is definitely influencing those policy decisions. So what's happening right now on the Hill is that the leadership team is talking on a member-by-member -member basis uh, to figure out what members would be comfortable voting for on the floor. And based on that, um, they're going to get a sense of how close they are to 218 votes. And if they feel like they are close to 218 votes, then they will schedule the legislation to be voted on the floor next week. If they need a little bit more time to work through the legislation, then you won't see it on the floor next week. And then the the question then is, if the House successfully passes out this legislation, does the Senate really have to amend the bill? Or can they largely take the package as is? And so some of the conversations you're hearing with senators right now is an effort for the Senate to influence the package before it moves out of the House. Because if they can get the package that they want to vote on um, out of the House, then it makes, a, it, makes it a, a much quicker process where the Senate can just do um, more or less an up or down vote on the package um, 
once the house sends it over. So you've got a lot of, needless to say, a lot of dynamics in play right now. A lot of dynamics. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, do you have a moment for us to uh, open up the lines for questions? Hello, Cheryl, are you still there? I'm still here. Okay, um, we are going to open up the lines now. So if anyone um, has any questions for Cheryl regarding the American Health Care Act, um, feel free to ask it now. Um, we also have a chat box and a uh, Q&A box that you can uh, feel free to uh, ask questions in. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, it looks like uh, Patricia Egan is asking, uh, the CBO score includes a savings to the federal budget of $337 billion uh, 2017 and 2026, in addition to 24 million people losing their insurance. Perhaps I missed it, but I didn't see the CBO score including the cost of those 24 million people needing other forms of health aid or uh, ER uh, costs. Oh my goodness. Um, well, I can't give you the complete analysis of how CBO gets its coverage numbers. I'm, I'm not a CBO analyst, but I think some of the points that the Republican leadership team has been making about those figures, just so you know what they're saying, is that when you remove an individual mandate, um, you're giving people the choice as to whether or not they're going to buy that insurance. And by definition, because it's not mandated, CBO is always going to score that people may make the personal decision not to get health care. I personally agree with you. Um, America pays for health care one way or another. We just pay for it very inefficiently. Um, whether or not all of those moving pieces of additional hospital expenses um, are, are calculated into the score, I just don't recall that off the top of my head. I mean, there are policy pieces in the legislation, specifically the, um, I'm going to miss it's like the Patient and Stability Fund. I'm, I'm miscall I'm, I know it's got a fancier name than that. Uh, the Patient and Stability Fund, which is funded over a decade at about $100 billion, where states have the choice um, to figure out how they're going to help people with um, high-risk high patients, uh, rare disease patients, chronic disease patients, to make sure that they get access to coverage, which the CBO did highlight that that account in itself could help. But I agree with you. There's a lot of... Um, overlapping pieces that, that, that are not reflected in one score. And that's probably another point. We, we have such a tendency in D.C. to talk about a piece of legislation as altering the universe. And in many ways, this one will. Um, but it is not the only legislation that Republicans have discussed moving in the health care space. And um, obviously, there's not the cross analysis of some of the other concepts and how those would work and um, interplay with folks. So I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not a CBO analyst, but that's my best try. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, does anyone else have any questions uh, regarding the American Health Care Act? Uh, Patricia said thank you, by the way. Um, Come. And it looks like uh, that's it. So I'll, uh, well, thank you for joining us, Cheryl. We'll uh, uh, move it along to, um, AB 265, um, Wood and Copay Assistance. Uh, give me a, a moment to um, get uh, um, Jennifer Zins on the line. Hi, Jennifer, are you there? Jennifer? Jennifer, are you there? Hello? Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Would you like me to begin? Uh, go for it. Okay. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Jennifer Zins with Perry Communications Group. Um, we are uh, coordinating a, a coalition of organizations that are opposed um, to AB 265, and we reached out to your organization to see if this is something um, that um, is important to you all, and we were asked to provide a quick update on the bill, which um, 
I will do kind of from a, a high level, I will do my best to answer any technical questions if I'm not able to on the call. Happy to, um, you know, get those answered and, and circle back with you. So um, AB 265 has been introduced by Assembly Member Jim Wood. He is um, chair of the Assembly Health Committee. Um, essentially, the bill would ban patients in California from receiving copayment assistance from a um, pharmaceutical manufacturer when a therapeutically equivalent or interchangeable brand or generic is available at a lower cost. Um, clearly, the majority of patients can be best served with the lowest cost drug option. Um, you know, almost 90% of drug prescription are filled with a generic drug. Um, and, and in California, pharmacists are allowed to substitute for therapeutically equivalent or interchangeable drugs. However, um, we all know there are some patients with, with some diseases who are unable to take the lowest cost drug option for a variety of reasons. Um, and a number of these organizations are very concerned that forcing these patients to choose the lowest drug option is penny wise and pound foolish when factoring in additional healthcare costs of medication errors and, and non-adherence. Um, for some patients, you know, using a therapeutically equivalent or interchangeable drug may not be an option due to an allergy or adverse reaction to an inactive ingredient. Um, they, forcing these patients to change due to the cost may result in more costly medication and non-adherence. Non As you know, um, non-adherence costs um, the U.S. economy an estimated 100 billion to 300 billion an annually. So trying, trying to avoid that, and that's a major concern among a number of the organizations that are opposing um, the bill. Um, manu manufacturer coupons um, are a solution to ensuring that patients pay the lowest cost for prescription drugs and have access to the, to the drugs they need. Um, oftentimes, patients who utilize these copay options for specialty meds have a much higher out-of-pocket cost compared to patients that do not utilize these copay assistance programs. For example, on average, about 48% of patients who use a copay coupon when filling a prescription for a specialty med have cost sharing between $51 and $250 before utilizing the coupon, and another 18% of patients have cost sharing higher than $251 before utilizing the coupon. So, you know, patients um, in California are concerned by, by eliminating this option. It's going to lead to their inability to get the medication that is best for their particular um, illness or, or disease and could, could lead to non-adherence. Um, we have a group, circ a group letter that's being circulated in California that we have invited um, your organization to sign on to. There are a number of organizations on that letter, including um, Alliance for Patient Access, the American Liver Foundation, California Hepatitis C Task Force, California Senior Advocates League, uh, Embracing Latina Leadership Alliances, the International Foundation for Autoimmune Arthritis, uh, Arthritis Foundation, Lupus Foundation, NAACP California, Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease, Neuropathy Action Foundation, and the Medical Oncology Association of Southern California, all who are very concerned um, about this, this bill and how it would uh, impact patient safety and access to necessary medications. I will stop there and um, take any questions or um, clarify anything. Um, and then would just ask, you know, that your organization, um, if it makes sense for you guys to weigh in on this, it would be fantastic to have you as part of our group letter. Um, also, any individual concerns can be addressed to um, Assemblymember Wood's office, which we've provided that information up on the webinar today. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, does anyone have any uh, any questions? It looks like uh, Patricia Egan's wondering whether um, we can send a link to the letter for signatures, or whether um, you know what, what we can do is if you, uh, Jennifer, if you send that over to me, I can forward it along to the attendees today. That would be fantastic. And and again, um, if you send us your logo, we'd love to include it on this group sign-on letter in California. Um, sometimes these letters have a good impact when they see. It sounds, sorry. 
Okay, thank you. Um, go on. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, yeah, if if anyone's interested in signing on, if you want to send your, I, I will send you the letter um, with all of the links. And then if anyone's interested in signing on, if you want to send us over your logo, we'll add you to the group letter. And then you're also welcome to, you know, send in your own letter of concern or, or opposition or, you know, make a phone call or, or email. So happy happy to follow up with you guys on that. Jennifer, you might want uh, John Maddox with Infusion. You might want to reach out to the Epilepsy Foundation on this. This is a very high uh, priority issue, I think, for them in terms of the uh, pharmacokinetic differences between some of the products that are out there. Uh, and that can have some really grave potential for the patients who yeah. uh, put up in that. Absolutely, and they are reviewing um, the legislation right now. I know that they um, this legislation has been attempted in some other states, and the Epilepsy Foundation um, or groups within those states have weighed in. We're, we're waiting to hear from our group here in California, but they have been reached out to. Thank you. Hey, um, this is Carrie Burke. I was just wondering, do, do we foresee um, this happening, this type of legislation happening in any other states, and if so, what states are those? Um, Carrie, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that there was a bill in New Hampshire. Yeah, I thought I heard. Real quick. Um, there was a Michigan. There, there's there been a couple of bills, and I don't know exactly what states, but I know there was a, uh, a New Hampshire bill, and I believe maybe a Washington piece of legislation as well. I don't know if it's going to pop in other states, but you know how it works with California. If it yeah. happens here, it, it potentially can pop and spread out, out east. Um, it looks like uh, Patricia Egan also has a question. Um, she's wondering what what's the motivation behind the bill? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, we're, not, we're not entirely certain. Um, I mean, it is what it is at this point. I mean, if it's amended, you know, we'll have to assess those amendments and, and see what that does to patients. But I, I don't know what the motivation from Assemblymember Wood's perspective is for for um, for authoring the bill. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I Can will remute the line. Oh, sorry. It looks sounds like we do have a question. Yes, Darlene Shelton here, actually from Missouri, but um, I'm part of the bleeding disorders community and have a lot of friends in California. Is this regarding only um, for um, generic meds, or would this be for whatever the cheapest med would be? Um, that is a good question. Let me let me look at my notes really quick and see if that's specified anywhere. Um, I think it would be the lowest cost. What it states is if there's a therapeutically equivalent or interchangeable brand or generic that's available at lower cost. Okay, I will, as soon as I get that email, I will pass it on to the other bleeding disorder communities, um, groups in California, because that would definitely affect um, that whole population. Fantastic, Darlene. I, I, I appreciate that. I will include my contact information on there and, and happy, to, happy to chat with anyone um, within that population that, that would like some more information. Okay, great. Thanks. Then uh, Dean Sir asks uh, what uh, what your email address is, so that uh, people who are on the call can uh, send you an email about this. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, it's uh, Jennifer J E N N I F E R at perrycom dot com. That's P like Paul E R R Y C O M dot com. Here, let me see if I can put it in the notes really quickly. I don't know if every, everyone can see this. Okay. Did you get that? 
Um, I don't see it, but what, I'll, what, but what I can do right now is I'm, I'm sending it to all, all participants, so you should be able to see it in your chat box, everyone. It's uh, jennifer at aricom.com. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, if that give me a moment, I'm going to be uh, remuting the lines and then um, Next, we, are have, we will have uh, Stephanie Krenrich with the um, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation who will um, be uh, giving an update on uh, their sign-on letter. Um, so just, just a moment, let me, uh, let me make sure that uh, I have Stephanie unmuted. Stephanie, are you there? I am here. Okay, great. Here. Good. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to all of the folks on the call today. Um, so, so yeah, um, the reason that I wanted to address everyone today is to let uh, the organizations on the call know about a letter that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is circulating on Medicaid. So what the letter says is that the provision in the American Health Care Act, which Cheryl spoke about earlier, the provisions in the bill that impact Medicaid, so there are two of them. One would phase out Medicaid expansion, and one would enact a per capita cap on Medicaid spending. So it would change the financing structure of the Medicaid program nationwide. And the effect of that would, in our view, is that it would impact, have an adverse impact on patients throughout the country. Um, about 50% of kids with cystic fibrosis and about a third of adults with cystic fibrosis rely on Medicaid for either primary or secondary insurance, and it is a vital safety net. I know for our community and for a lot of communities. And we are very concerned that capping Medicaid funding and phasing out Medicaid expansion is going to lead to less services, less coverage of vital health care needs for people with rare diseases, chronic diseases, serious conditions, um, and we're very concerned about it. So what we are doing is we are circulating a letter to organizations and asking folks to join us in sending a letter to congressional leadership. So the letter will go to Majority Leader McConnell and, the leader, and to Speaker Ryan, and we've CC'd um, the chairs and ranking members of the relevant committees and the minority leader in the House and the minority leader in the Senate. Uh, so the letter will go to Republican leadership and express grave concern about the Medicaid provisions in the American Health Care Act and how it will impact patients. Uh, we're all also asking um, if provider organizations want to sign on as well. So if there are any provider organizations on the call, this letter is not just for patients. Um, so the groups that have signed on so far, we have about 27 groups so far, but the original signers include the Diabetes Association, the Lung Association, March of Dimes, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Uh, we are accepting signatures on this letter through Friday evening, so if you would like to sign on, please do let us know. Um, I do not know how to, I think I'm, I'm able to advance the slides, but I'm not sure how to do it. So Max, could you do it please? There we go, thank you. Um, here's the contact information for Stevie Parker on my team and for me. So if you would like more information, if you'd like to see the letter, uh, learn a little bit more about the letter or sign on your organization, please contact Stevie and I and we can help you with that. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, if you have a moment, I'll uh, open up the lines for any questions people might have. Sounds good. All right, does anyone have any questions for Stephanie? Hey, Stephanie, uh, this is John Maddox with Infusion. Uh, are you going to be reaching out, or is this going to go out under the cystic fibrosis uh, letterhead per se? I mean, this is an issue that affects quite a few uh, orphan diseases along the way. It might be one oh. of the braver threats that we have here. Oh, absolutely. No, it's not going to go out under the cystic fibrosis hey, letterhead. There will, there will be no it? letterhead. Okay, good. Great. I want to, this one of these webinars, but 
I don't think you need to worry about joining this one. It's one of those rare disease ones. It's going to be over in just a little bit. Okay. Um, Started okay. about noon. Yeah. No, not. There was some talk earlier about trying to roll it into the bigger health bill, and I, I don't know where that's at. But there. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for, uh, for Stephanie? Okay, great. Um, with that, uh, I will be remuting the lines. Um, And you can, of course, feel free to uh, email us here at RDLA if you have any questions after the call. Um, so next we have uh, Patricia Egan, who will be uh, giving an update on the uh, Lymphedema Treatment Act. Thank you, Matt. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud Matt? and clear. Okay, fine. So, um, the lymphed so I'm Pat Egan from the National Lymphedema Network. I also am the California State Team Leader for the Lymphedema Treatment Act. So let's see if I can. Okay. So, all right. So the Lymphedema Treatment Act has been introduced in the 115th Congress as H.R. 930. Senate Bill 497. It provides a Medicare benefit to cover essential compression garments, um, which are needed for the treatment and daily care and management of lymphedema. Um, there's no pharmaceutical treatment for lymphedema, and um, unfortunately, it can be deadly uh, if it's not treated properly. So um, compression is daily compression with um, excellent client patient um, compliance is the key to avoiding um, cellulitis infections and other, um, and other outcomes of this disease. Um, one of the things that I put on this slide is that some people said, well, we don't want to support just a single disease legislation. We got a lot of that early on. And um, so we developed some um, material to document that lymphedema is really an, um, an umbrella term associated with about 45 rare diseases as noted in the North um, definition. And this is our infographic that we did along those lines just so that people could understand that um, this is a collective term. So in the last uh, Congress, we were able to garner through all volunteers um, in all 50 states, um, grassroots um, efforts, we garnered 261 co-sponsors in the House and 29 co-sponsors in the Senate. And we did a little analysis and actually 80% of the House members of the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus and 33% of the Senate members who sponsored this bill. So we owe a great deal of thanks to the rare disease community and especially the rare disease legislative um, advocates. Um, this bill was just reintroduced, so we tried to reintroduce it early um, in both chambers so that um, we can get moving on this bill and get this legislation passed in this um, Congress. So as of today, we have 63 co-sponsors on record in the House, and I know that there are a few more in the queue, they just haven't been posted, and 13 co-sponsors in the Senate. So I believe that we're making progress. Um, and again, I was in Washington, D.C. with RDLA for the Rare Disease Week, and I felt that it was extremely well organized and effective, and I felt that the Rare Disease Week effort was able to um, get to um, key HLAs and key people who would have the ability to 
move not just the Lymphedema Treatment Act, but also the Open Act and all the other legislation that the rare disease community is concerned with forward. So again, we thank the RDLA for all of the organization and excellent um, contacts. So there will be a Lymphedema Lobby Day um, effort at the end of March in D.C. I don't think it will be as large as what RDLA was able to put forward, but um, we are, we'll probably have 100 people there. But, and they've all been briefed that as long as we're going to be doing lobbying, we should make sure that our lobbying efforts are inclusive. Um, obviously, we'll focus on the bill at hand, but also make certain that the people with whom we meet understand the overall context of the efforts on behalf of rare disease patients. So with that, I just wanted to bring you up to date, let you know that the bill had been reintroduced, give you a little bit of background in case people were not familiar with this piece of legislation. And um, I once again thank this community for its support. Thank you, Patricia. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for Pat? Anyone have uh, any questions? If not, th thank you very much, Pat. I'll, uh, um, it's always great having you all on the calls and um, giving updates on, on this uh, important piece of legislation. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Lisa. Of course. Um, and now we will, uh, my colleague uh, Max Bronstein will be giving um, the Capitol Hill update. Um, give me just a moment and uh, take it away, Max. Thank you, Vicki. Um, no, there's an extraordinary amount of, of changes and, and policy updates going on on Capitol Hill. So I, I wanted to, to touch base on on a few of you know the, the items that have really been in the news lately and, and try to fill in some of those gaps and, and hopefully try to explain what this could mean for, for the rare disease community. So I, I think probably most of you on, on the call are aware that we, we now have a, a nominee for the, the post of Commissioner of, of FDA. So for those who, who might not know much about um, Dr. Gottlieb, he's, he's been someone who's been quite active in, in the venture um, capital community. He's, he's actually a partner at NEA, a uh, prominent venture capital firm, and has also has a post at um, AEI, which is, is typically considered a conservative think tank in, in Washington, D.C., um, but he's also someone who's held posts both at the FDA and at CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and, and Medicare. So, um, and on top of that, somehow maintains a, a professorship at, at NYU. So he's one of these guys who's really um, has a lot of experience and definitely has a good understanding coming from not only his, his work within the government, but also working with the private sector as well. Um, and, and so we, we did a little research to try to see, you know, what, what he said in the past about rare disease issues. Um, he, he's definitely been one of the louder voices calling for for streamlining of, of the FDA um, in terms of what that, that actually means. He's actually talked in, in speeches specifically about creating more specialized um, reviews, review divisions for, for rare and ultra-rare diseases at the FDA, which uh, is exactly what we've been advocating for at the foundation since our inception. So very good to know that, that he you know, would support and enhance specialization at the agency. Um, and then he's also done some, some work, uh, again, that, that we have mirrored at the foundation around the accelerated approval pathway and, and the use of biomarkers. Just as a reminder, um, you know, this is, we view biomarkers and, and the accelerated approval pathway as, as a way of getting many more rare disease therapies to patients in, in a way that's far more expedient than, than the traditional pathways. Um, and then the graphic that you're seeing on the right was um, in, in 2015, we collaborated with a think tank, and they actually ran a full-page ad in the, in the New York Times specifically about the issue of biomarkers and to really raise awareness of, about this issue, which um, both Dr. Gottlieb signed on to as, 
as well as uh, Dr. Katkus, who's president at, at the Every Life Foundation. So um, clearly, Dr. Gottlieb has been thinking about rare disease issues, and I think you know, with what the the president spoke about during his his speech to Congress, this is something that is is clearly on the administration's mind as well. Uh, in terms of how we actually get to an official commissioner, um, so he will have to go through a committee vote with the Senate uh, Health Committee, and assuming that that he that his nomination passes out of committee, he would then go to a, a floor vote. Um, but of course, as you guys know, right now there's an extraordinary amount of um, debate going on around healthcare in general, and um, certainly, with PDUFA coming up, which I'll talk about later in the presentation, uh, there's just a lot of other demands on, on the committee's time. So it's very hard to predict exactly when he will get a, a committee vote. Um, in terms of potential pushback, we're, we're already hearing concerns that have come from some sort of some liberal Democrats. So Rosa Delora from Connecticut had, had concerns, and um, I think we are extremely likely that, to hear additional concerns from Senators uh, Warren and Sanders, most likely about Dr. Gottlieb's work with, with industry. So um, I, would, I would definitely expect those to, to come up. So that's uh, kind of what's going on with, with the nomination. I did mention PDUFA in the last slide, but this is kind of another huge item that, that is on um, the plate for the health committees in, in Congress. So just as a reminder for, for folks who might not be as familiar with with the DC acronyms, PDUFA stands for Prescription Drug User Fee Agreement, and, and this is the agreement between industry and the FDA that really enables um, industry funds to be used to enhance and, and improve and speed up drug review at, at the agency, um, but it's also considered must-pass legislation because without this, this legislation signed into law, um, the agency would actually not be able to perform any of the, the drug review activities. So um, it's, it's actually an opportunity to kind of attach other bills and related things onto if, if folks are interested in improving things relating to healthcare. So um, this, this is kind of a, a moving um, vehicle that, that people can use. Um, we do have the first uh, committee hearing that is scheduled, so this, you guys should mark your calendars for this. This will be coming up on on March 21st, and all of the, the FDA senior leadership will be present for, for this hearing. We're still waiting for, for dates for a House hearing, so hopefully we'll, we'll get those in the next week or two here. Um, and so the, the process going forward is that, you know, just like any bill, it goes through um, some hearings in, in committee, and then it has to get voted out of committee, um, and then we'll, we'll go to the floor um, at some point, and then um, ideally to, to the president, and all of this has to be done uh, by the deadline of, of July 31st. So the, the current PDUFA agreement actually doesn't expire until the end of September, but um, in order to avoid any disruptions at the FDA, we have to um, get this all done 60 days prior to, to the end of the current PDUFA agreement. So um, basically there's a lot to do and, and not a huge amount of time to do it. I, I do believe it it will all get done, but um, clearly uh, the focus on health care reform is, is kind of setting things back in terms of where we would normally be in, in the process. Um, Cheryl did a nice job kind of talking about the, the state of play around health care reform, so I'm, I'm going to be very brief around this. Um, you know, she, she talked about kind of the ideal circumstance for, for Republicans who are pushing for a vote that they would actually get to that point next week. I, I think that's still an, an open question um, because of the level of division that exists, not only the level of resistance from Democrats who are universally opposed, but there's also substantial divisions within the party as well as, as to what this bill should look like, and not only within the party, but also between what the House is, is calling for and what members of the Senate are calling for. There's, so there's still very stark differences that, that have to um, be addressed. I think most of this was was addressed when Cheryl spoke about the CBO score, so I won't um, get into that. And, and honestly, it's probably not worth going to too much detail about this legislation because if there's one thing I am sure of, it's, it's going to have to change substantially before it, it really advances in Congress. I did want to note that um, last week President Trump did invite um, folks 
sort of regular citizens from across the country to, to the White House to speak about their experience um, under the, the current health care law. Um, and I'm happy to report that Sam Summers, who's, who's a rare disease advocate from Utah, was there with the president as well as uh, Dr. Price, the, the head of, of Health and Human Services, to talk about his kind of health care experiences. So you can check out that, that video and, and read the full report at, um, at Rare Disease Report online. So I also wanted to kind of shift gears here and, and talk a little bit about um, where we are with, with the OPEN Act, because I, I think you know, many of you know this is something the Foundation has been working on, and we have um, nearly 200 patient organizations signed on in support of this bill. So for those who might not be familiar with, with OPEN, the, the goal is, is really to get more treatments to patients. And, and we think we can actually do that in, in a very quick and um, relatively inexpensive way by repurposing existing therapies for rare disease indications. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why repurposing is, is attractive, but for us, you know, thinking about it from the patient perspective, it's one of the fastest ways we can get safe and effective treatments to patients that, that we know of. Um, but it's ultimately something that, that's being under-leveraged as, as a pathway, uh, and that's because there's not typically not a lot of incentive um, for companies to uh, put resources into investigating repurposing for a rare disease, again, because of small patient populations. So what, what the OPEN Act would actually do is, is create that incentive, which would be a six-month extension of, of exclusivity. Um, and, and we think this would be really important in, in basically creating a, a rare purposing industry or an industry that's focused just on repurposing specifically for rare disease patients. Um, so, I'll give you a little bit of an update as, as to where we are on the kind of state of play here. Um, so we do have bipartisan support and bicameral support for the legislation. Um, it was actually passed in the House back in the first CHEERS package back in July 2015, but did not make it into the final um, 21st century CHEERS package. We do have a new uh, House bill that was just introduced on, on Rare Disease Day. and so. Very happy to report that we have three original co-sponsors there, um, as well as five co-sponsors who came on since the bill was was introduced. So um, that's that's terrific momentum, um, and we're we're hoping that we'll actually see a Senate bill uh, soon, possibly in the next couple weeks here. So stay tuned for for more there. Um, ways to get engaged if if you're not already. So um, if you're an organization, we we would definitely love to have you sign on to to support the OPEN Act. Right now we're, we're up to 180, and our goal is to get to uh, 200. Um, for individuals, there will be opportunities to take action. We're, we're waiting for a Senate bill, and once that's introduced, we'll, we'll likely have a, a joint action alert so that folks can reach out to, to their members and, and encourage them to, to co-sponsor the legislation. Um, if, if you want to get your um, group signed on to, to support OPEN, you can feel free to uh, shoot me an email, and we'll get you get you included there. Um, I also want to note that we are doing an open coalition call this Friday at, at 1 p.m. Eastern. So if you're interested in, in really kind of staying up to date on, on the latest and working closely with us on, on the legislation, I would certainly uh, welcome that. And again, you can email me to get the, the call in information for, for that meeting on Friday. So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to close and, and pause for a minute in case uh, folks have questions. You can certainly write in using the, the chat feature, or Vicki's going to work on, on muting all the lines, so um, you can ask them over the phone as well. Hi, I have a quick question. This is Allie Freitas with TTC Therapeutics. God forbid, what happens if the producer act doesn't pass? So in, in the, I'd say, very unlikely event that Congress can't come to an agreement, um, there, there is a risk that the um, employees at CEDAR and CBER, the ones that really lead drug review, um, would actually get, would basically be put on, on kind of like a layoff or they basically kind of get paused and temporarily dismissed from the agency. So it, in effect, would uh, halt drug review at the FDA, which typically is an, is an outcome that everyone, doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, everyone wants to avoid that, that outcome, so it's, I think it's highly unlikely. Um, there is, there is a, a 
remote possibility, I would say that, you know, we come to the end of July and might still be outstanding items that have not been fully addressed in, in PDUFA. And so if we cross that 60-day threshold, then FDA does have to give notice to some of their employees that, um, you know, there's a chance of, of layoffs. So um, people especially want to avoid that outcome, too. So those two things, I, I think, you know, we're unlikely to experience that, but there's, there is a, a risk there that that, that can mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks so much. Hi, Matt. Hi. Hi, it's Steve Gibson. Uh, the Energy and Commerce uh, will review it on the 22nd. Oh, great. So, okay. So we have a hearing date for... Um, we have, yeah, and, and because of everything going on in the Hill, it would be great if uh, any patient groups could do social media posts on the importance of and timeliness of PDUFA, um, so things do go unscheduled or any kind of statements, and I'd be happy to help anybody work with the Every Life Foundation on that. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for that update. Okay. Um, hi, my name's Rose. Um, I would love to get any information on that for my group. Um, I did a conference call to recap after rare disease week last week, and I would love to have information to send out to my group and also publicly to try to get people to support this. So are you going to have it listed on like a sample letter perhaps on your website that maybe we can then use and send out to our people? Um, we'll definitely post notices about the hearings. We don't have any um, alerts, action alerts or sample letters, mm -hmm. up, but we can work on them. And maybe, Steve, we can work with you on that. Yeah, be happy okay. to. Because we had a nice one that you gave us. By the way, great job with with last week. I really enjoyed it. It was my first time going. And the letters that you had given to us, I mean, they were very helpful when we were talking to our um, senators and congressmen. So right, thank you, appreciate Gladys. it. <laughs> hey, any other questions before we move on here? All right. Well, thank you, guys. I'm going to turn it back over to Peggy, who will announce our next speaker. So I am announcing myself. Um, <laughs> hi, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be covering um, the Every Life Foundation's um, efforts on newborn screening in Florida. Um, for those of you who are following, who've been following for the past year, um, this is uh, the second piece of legislation we've been working on um, in this area. Um, so what did what happened uh, what happened last year? Um, we worked on legislation here in California um, to streamline and improve newborn screening um, in the state. Uh, Senate Bill 1095 uh, was introduced by uh, Dr. Richard Pan, who's a, who's a state senator and a pediatrician, and um, you know this bill was intended to um, solve for a, uh, an issue in the newborn screening space in which every state screens for a different set of diseases. And um, due to the lack of uniformity, um, many babies fall through the cracks and, and um, you know, go undiagnosed uh, for several years for their diseases. Um, there's a federal committee that's known as the Advisory Committee on Irritable Disorders in Newborns and Children that issues a recommended uniform screening panel. Um, unfortunately, those recommendations aren't binding on any state. Um, so we decided to start with California to allow the state to screen for any disease uh, within two years after the disease is recommended um, as part of this panel. Um, that way, you know, uh, patient advocates um, and don't have to go to every state to get um, every disease added to their panels and, and it can instead focus um, you know, the efforts of the community on the federal committee um, and trying to uh, improve newborn screening there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it would eliminate the legislative delay in screening. Um, on average, it takes eight years for a disease to be considered for the Rust panel, and then another eight years in addition um, for states to begin screening. That's 16 years during which um, babies aren't being screened for diseases that have FDA-approved treatments. Um, so SB 1095 um, was had had a ton of support thanks to uh, you know many of the people that are on this call and and many other organizations. There were over 120 patient organizations that that showed support, and um, it breezed through every committee and and both uh, and both floors here in California. It um, it passed unanimously. 
and Governor Jerry Brown signed the bill into law um, on September 16th. And now California will have to screen for MPS1 and Pompeii by August 26, 2018. And then for any new disease that's added to the federal uh, recommendation, the state will have to screen within two years of that addition. So that we did face a, a number of uh, difficulties in the process. Um, you know, there's the cost and feasibility of screening. Um, what, what, you know, the the process of procuring new kits and reagents, hiring staff. Um, the cost of treatment, um, you know, some of it ends up being covered by Medicaid, so um, it can it can cost some amount to the state. Um, we were uh, there were some concerns from the hospital association regarding whether they'd have to um, get new equipment or they'd have to train people um, to perform new tests. And finally, there were Department of Public Health concerns um, regarding a time frame for implementation. Thankfully, we were able to um, you know assuage many of these concerns um, both by um, ensuring that, uh, you know, number one, that hospitals wouldn't have to get new equipment to do these, these screens, they're done through the public health labs, and that um, additionally, you know, when you're, um, when you're treating a, a baby, um, you know, you're avoiding additional costs that come in the way of um, surgeries, uh, misdiagnoses, um, other developmental care that will be required for people um, throughout their lives. You know, as I mentioned, every state is different. So um, since we worked on the California legislation, we decided to look for, for other states in which, in which to move into. You know, California is a very blue state. So, you know, having some amount of, of balance uh, would be helpful for us to be able to move forward in states across the country. Um, the four uh, highest birth rate states are California, New York, Texas, and Florida. Um, and we ended up uh, settling on Florida eventually as being our next target in order to uh, move forward on newborn screening. So to give you some background on Florida, Florida screens for 215, they screen 215,000 uh, babies each year. For every disease that's on the RUSP uh, panel, except for X-linked ALD, MPS1, and Pompeii. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned uh, before, we, we end up taking a tailored approach. Um, the California bill would be impossible in Florida. Florida has a constitutional provision that says that it's unconstitutional to defer to any federal standards. So we had to think a little bit differently about what this, what this bill would look like. Additionally, um, Florida has a genetics and newborn screening advisory council that makes recommendations for what, uh, what diseases ought to be screened for. This council meets twice a year, and it has 15 members that include um, consumer advocates, which are, which are patient advocates, um, academics, doctors, um, and other and, and industry professionals. Um, you know, these, this uh, advisory council has recommended X-linked ALD two years ago, but unfortunately, the governor didn't include it in his budget. Um, so, moving forward, we wanted to ensure that once a disease is recommended, that they don't end up with these types of, of cop-outs. Um, so we, uh, we settled on legislation that would require the council to review new diseases added to the RUSP within one year and enable Florida to screen for any disease on the RUSP within another year of approval by the council. This has actually shifted as of today. It's going to be an 18-month um, frame of time that would give the uh, Department of Health the time that they need in order to get the funding necessary to get new equipment. So with regard to moving the Florida bill forward, um, it, it's been introduced in the Senate and in the House. Um, the Senate bill is 1124, and its sponsor is uh, Senator Lauren Book, um, who's a Democrat from Fort Lauderdale. And in the House, it's House Bill 963, um, and, and the sponsor is Representative Heather Fitzenhagen, who's a Republican from, from Fort Myers. So it's, it's bipartisan legislation, um, and we want to make sure that uh, we have as, as broad a base of support as possible. Um, important dates, uh, March 15th, that's today, uh, HB 963 was heard in the House Health Quality Subcommittee. I'll, I'll let you know how it went just uh, in a moment. Um, but uh, on, on April 25th, that's the last day for committees to meet and, and consider bills. Um, May 5th is the last day of the legislative session. And the governor has 15 days from passage of the bill to sign or veto legislation. 
So what we've done so far, we've worked with a number of organizations, the March of Dimes, National MPS Society, the Acid Maltase Deficiency Association, and the Muscular Dystrophy Association to enlist uh, support and expertise. So uh, this comes from patients in Florida and, and medical professionals that can provide some background that we need. Um, you know, these organizations, uh, like, like many of yours, were all instrumental in getting our legislation passed in, in California, so we're trying to take a similar approach in Florida. We've hired an experienced lobbying team, um, including uh, Ronald Book and Kelly Mallette, um, who, are, who are located um, in Florida and, and we're in Tallahassee today for the hearing. Um, we've identified and confirmed bipartisan sponsors um, who serve on the relevant committees. So Senator Book, for example, uh, sits on both the Health uh, Committee and sits on the uh, Fiscal Committee, which, um, which gives us uh, the relationships that we need to be able to uh, get votes in favor of the bill. Um, we presented on February 3rd to the Genetics and Newborn Screening Advisory Council about about this bill and about our plans for it and, and got some feedback from them. Um, you know, that was that was mixed, but we, we want to ensure that um, we're taking into account people's concerns as, as we move forward. And then our great news is that uh, the bill passed the House Health Quality Subcommittee today unanimously. Um, we had um, two parent advocates who, who appeared um, in support of the bill. Um, and uh, they, one is an, an MPS1 um, mother, and the other one is a, uh, is a Pompeii father. They, were, uh, they both um, told their stories and convinced uh, Florida's uh, um, House Health Quality Subcommittee to, uh, to, approve, to uh, um, pass the bill on to its next step. So it's going to be moving from there onto the fiscal committee, and um, the Senate bill will be heard in its uh, health committee sometime uh, later this month. So of course, we need your help once again to move this legislation forward. Um, you know, most importantly, you can sign your organization on in support. Um, we have already uh, received uh, over 25 um, patient organizations that signed on in support. So just visit uh, bit.ly um, forward slash Florida NBS to sign on. Um, the page is active right now, um, so I urge you all to please uh, visit the page and uh, and um, get your organization uh, in support of the bill. Um, we also hope that you can uh, submit patient stories. Uh, it's very important that we illustrate how newborn screening saves lives. And additionally, you know, the surgeries that um, people have, uh, have undergone for, for, the, for their children and for themselves and um, how those uh, can be avoided through the process. We also urge you to share uh, the sign-on letter with your Florida contacts and, and urge them to write their legislators in support of the bill. Um, we're working on putting together an action center that will be um, up and running by our next call, so um, we'll definitely let you know um, when that is up. And of course, you can contact us uh, if you'd like to meet with legislators and testify in support of the bill. Uh, Florida patients and advocates are incredibly important to the process and demonstrate the need for, for robust screening in that state. And finally, if you have any economic data that can support the case for newborn screening, um, you know, how we're avoiding costly surgeries, misdiagnoses, mental health support, and other uh, health care costs, that would be immensely helpful. Um, it helped us with moving the legislation forward in California, and, um, you know, judging by the response that we've received in Florida, it would, uh, it would definitely behoove us to, um, to produce that information for them as well. Uh, that's actually it for, uh, for this segment, but I will have my contact information up at the end of the presentation. So um, you can also, of course, you can visit um, the, uh, the link above on, uh, on how to support uh, newborn screening in Florida, and uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions on um, newborn screening or how you'd like to get involved. And with that, I'm going to open up the lines for any questions that anyone might have regarding um, the Florida newborn screening legislation. Hi there, Dean Sir with MLD Foundation. Hey, I just wanted to point out two things. One, with that bit.ly link, that capitalization is really important. Uh, you have to upper and lower case, right? But uh, it's also important for all of us to, uh, to build on what um, uh, Vicki told us at the beginning, that this is not just a Florida issue. This is part of building momentum for uh, making similar changes in all other states. So the learning and the success um, is really, really important. 
Thank you, Dean. Yeah, um, you know, what, what Dean's saying is, is correct. There's a legislation um, in the works in, in Missouri, in Oregon, in, um, and, and in Georgia, um, and, and North Carolina um, that could be incredibly impactful um, in newborn screening. So we're looking at this as, as the baseline and, and um, a way for us to really push the conversation forward. So any way in which um, it can help, it would be incredibly helpful. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, well, of course, I'll have my contact information up at the end, and uh, if you have any questions, you can reach me there or at the uh, everylifefoundation.org website. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, move it on over to um, Nancy Goodman with uh, Kids v. Cancer, who will be giving um, an update on a, piece, a couple of pieces of legislation that uh, Kids v. Cancer has been working on. Nancy, are you there? I am. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to present, and thank you all of you on the call. Um, the Race for Children Act is um, a bill that reforms the Pediatric Research Equity Act and Best Pharmaceuticals for Children's Act. Um, the, the, uh, the premise is that companies developing drugs for adults should also undertake studies in kids. and um, that, that's the premise of the Pediatric Research Equity Act, or PREA. And what Ray says is that in the area of cancer, when drugs are developed by molecular target, the company should still develop the drugs in kids when the molecular targets are relevant. Mm -hmm. So where we are politically is um, RACE was introduced in February as H.R. 1231 and Senate 456. Um, by in the House by Mike McCall and G.K. Butterfield, and in the Senate by Senator Michael Bennett and Senator Marco Rubio. Um, our goal is attachment in Padufa. We have um, 250 over 250 advocate, advocacy groups that have endorsed us, and we have about two dozen leading hospitals that have endorsed us. Um, whether or not we um, succeed is really a function of whether we can get sufficient buy-in from bio and pharma, the trade associations of the pharmaceutical industry, um, and I suppose RDLA, now that RDLA is becoming an influential organization. Um, and so we are um, putting our documents on our website and we will be starting a series of conference calls to inform all of you about it. And so what does this mean? So under race, two things would happen. One is if a company is developing a drug for adult cancer, um, the FDA would have authority to require pediatric studies in certain cases. And when are those cases? So those cases would be when the molecular target of the drug is relevant for pediatric cancer. So that's the main premise of race. And then the second piece is that when a cancer drug has an orphan status, because it has a molecular target, um, that would not be a reason to, for a sponsor to be exempted from obligations to study the drugs in kids. Um, so we've been shopping race. We, race was actually introduced last Congress, and we did not get it introduced in 21st Century Cures, but we've been speaking to congressional staff for years about it. Um, there's a view that's widely held that this is really the right thing to do. In fact, it was endorsed in a Nature editorial. And, um, and so we're hopeful that will make a difference. Um, I'm going to close there, um, and I welcome any questions or comments from folks on the phone. Thank you, Nancy. Does anyone have any questions uh, regarding the Race for Children's Act? Any questions? Well, thank um, you. We, of course, you can visit. Thank you so much. My, my, um, there's a there's a link on the uh, on the uh, on the template. If you have any further questions, um, if you go to kidsvcancer.org, you can see all sorts of information on race, and we invite you to get involved. And uh, appreciate everybody's support. 
Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. Next, we're going to have uh, Dean Sir, who will give an update on rarepolicy.us. Uh, um, give me just a moment, and I will uh, I will get you. Uh, I think I'm good. Can you hear me? Max, can you hear me? Or uh, Biggie? Yep. Okay, you've given me control. That's a that's a bad thing. Uh, good morning uh, to those of you on the west side of the U.S. and uh, good afternoon to to all of the rest. Um, it's been a it's been a great call, and I can't think that kind of lays some good groundwork for what I want to share over just the next couple of minutes here. Um, RarePolicy.us uh, is a platform, a tool that I put together on the tail end of 21st Century Cures out of my own frustration uh, in not being able to motivate uh, my community uh, or not to be able to connect my community into uh, the whole process of uh, how to support um, what's going on uh, in policy. And I've uh, uh, taken this idea and uh, expanded it out so that we can use it for example, over these last four or five issues that we've talked about, there's all different ways of getting connected and of connecting our communities and so on. And what I've, what I've created is a, um, a tool that will allow us to do that together. Um, as you know, there are thousands, 10, you know, 7,000 plus diseases, 30 million people, but we are not organized well from a policy perspective. We get together as advocacy groups, but we have not enabled our great um, uh, constituency of 30 plus million people. Uh, policy for most organizations is well down uh, the list. They're very, very busy doing research and awareness, and the policy that does trickle down gets very complicated. And even as I've been trying to um, take notes on what's going on here um, today and what are the action steps, it's confusing. Our community is 30 million. It's bigger than the HIV AIDS, the LGBT, and the union voices. Um, uh, I guess we're bigger in terms of people. We may not be bigger. Uh, in terms of our voice yet. And we affect uh, neighbors and friends and parents and bosses and so on. Um, so we are actually a much, much larger community, but we've got to have the, uh, an ability to work together. So I'm proposing this uh, tool, actually it's up and it's live, uh, to create what I'm calling an, a rare army. Um, not to change policy, but to allow the policy that um, others are proposing to be easily presented to you as advocacy organizations and on down to your constituents so that we can have that large unified voice uh, on Capitol Hill. And also to be ready to take that action at a moment's notice without all of us having to pull a lever within our individual communities. Um, the impact on the recipients will be improved as well uh, through a bunch of things that I'm not going to get into here today, but basically reflecting voting record and whether they're pro or con, we will message them differently. Um, so uh, it will really be personalized to the recipient. And probably more significantly, we will uh, copy the health legislative aides, sponsors, committee members, the people that are actually making this legislation go forward. So it's not just your senator, but it's the people on, um, on the committees and, and, and so on that need to be in. Uh, we had a situation a couple of weeks ago where the committee voted on the uh, uh, HACA at uh, 4 a.m. There was a tweet at 7 a.m. And where were we? We're still talking about uh, how to respond with uh, a unified voice. We could be doing this very, very quickly. So let me just show you um, uh, briefly what this is. It's a tool. It doesn't take more of your time. It will be, uh, if you so choose, a portal that you can have on your website where you keep your constituents. This is not about another organization or another you know, grab of, of uh, people that are related to your organizations. This is a tool, kind of like a Twitter feed would show up on, on the corner of your website. This would work in a similar way to both engage people uh, in policy, but also to educate them and then to empower them. So not just please sign on this letter, but we'll have some messaging that goes there that helps to um, uh, get people to the point of where they're even interested in signing on. Um, as I mentioned, this is not a source of policy. This is a tool to support the policy that wonderful groups like we've already heard from today, RDLA Nord, um, Kids with Cancer, so on and so forth. Um, so I am, I'm not creating new policy here, just uh, organizing it and simplifying it. As I mentioned before, advocacy orgs will get all of the credit. Sorry for the fonts here. They, uh, they kind of readjusted as, I, as they were imported. Um, and uh, some key benefits for, for the constituents. Um, this will be truly one click to action as we build rapport with them. They'll be seeing an email uh, perhaps on their smartphone and they can just hit the yes button and it's all done. If they want to go in and customize letters, that's great. 
but uh, we have such transient people with uh, so little time and so short of attention span that we need to make this as simple as possible. Um, the the uh, overhead on your, your side will be zero. It will just happen. And obviously, you can get involved if you want. If you have specific legislative issues you want to present to your community, the portal will allow you to do that as well so that you can go down your proprietary path um, uh, for your specific issues or more globally for the uh, more global issues. The rarepolicy.us website, if you want to see how this works, um, the standalone is available right now. Uh, the portals are in beta site. We're just rolling those out. Uh, the actual white labeled unbranded uh, portal for your website. And you'll see new things coming um, every week. Uh, so stay tuned. And if you're interested, uh, shoot me an email. Many of you know me from my MLD Foundation work. This is actually not an MLD Foundation initiative. Uh, but uh, contact me with the email there, dean at rarepolicy.us, or on my MLD. Thank you for your time. Any questions, I'm happy to uh, chat with you. Great. Does anyone have uh, any questions for Dean? Hi, Dean. Sarah Tompkin. Um, do you have to be a patient organization or an advocacy group in order to use this, or can individuals use this portal? Great question. It's actually targeted at the individuals, but what I don't oh, want great. to do is cut the advocacy organizations out of those communications. So um, individuals can just go to can, ju can just go to rarepolicy.us. You can share that out, mm -hmm. and, and, and they're good to go. Or organizations can embed in their portal. Whenever anybody goes through their portal, their identity would be um, uh, conveyed back to the advocacy organization so they know, um, you know who, who, who's using this tool, and they can track it on reports and also um, uh, re-stimulate uh, those particular individuals on um, uh, the advocacy-specific issues. Well, great. Thank you so much for creating this. It sounds very exciting. Jean, this is Eric Hartman with the Coordinator Research Foundation. Yes, go ahead, Eric. Uh, my question about the portal, uh, our suggestion, I'm not sure of the size, but I know all of us are generally working through a website. So the question is, how big is this portal in size? Will it be just an icon to click on? Because we all try and manage or manage our, our page or our main page for content. Yeah, great, great question as well. Uh, today, it, uh, it's a, a fixed size, um, but it's it's on my short list to be able to have it just as a badge or as a much smaller, you know, I mentioned a Twitter feed, kind of a much smaller uh, physical uh, space as well. Um, those sorts of things are easy to, um, to customize. It's just a matter of priority. So if you have specific requests, I'd be happy to respond to those. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions for Dean? Great. Thanks, all. Great. Thank you. And with that, we're going to be closing out our call. Um, you can all feel free to contact me if you have any questions or you want to be on the agenda for uh, next month's RDLA call. Um, my email address is up on the up on the screen now. It's vganapathy and everylifefoundation.org. Um, and you can visit rareadvocates.org. Um, we'll have a recording of this presentation available by the end of the day. Um, and we definitely, you know, urge you to share that with your contacts. Um, and our next webinar and conference call is scheduled for April 19th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific, same as same time as uh, as the call today. So we of course uh, look forward to speaking with you all then. Thank you all for joining.